Uh, good morning, all. I'm Larry Olson, uh, President and Chief Engineer of Olson Engineering. Uh, it's my pleasure today to welcome to you to uh, another monthly webinar. Uh, we kind of combined November and December with Thanksgiving to be just one webinar. Uh, and today's webinar, as you can see, is on assessment of building conditions using non-destructive evaluation methods. It'll be given by myself for the first part. And Dennis Sack, our Senior Vice President and Principal Engineer, will give the second part. And then we'll answer questions. It'll be approximately an hour long. And we do appreciate everyone attending today and wish everybody a happy holiday season. Uh, as a matter of note, uh, if you go to our website, olsonengineering.com, you can go to the uh, services tab and then down to the bottom, it says training of that. And then under there are the webinars. And those are links to our YouTube uh, where we have posted videos of the previous webinars, which have been on a wide range of topics from geophysics, seismic, refraction, et cetera, and bridges, dams, uh, lightweight deflectometer, a whole range of webinars we started doing in April. So with that, uh, let's get right to the webinar. Uh, you can certainly post questions into the chat, but we'll probably address most questions at the end rather than as we go. So I'll stop my video and we'll begin. So a standard reference, uh, I, I happen to be a member of this non-destructive testing committee, uh, which is on ACI 228, and it's a report on non-destructive test methods for evaluation of concrete and structures. It summarizes a whole range of methods applicable to concrete. Today, we're gonna to highlight stress wave methods for structures as well as radar. So the building non-destructive evaluation case histories and methods we're gonna go over will include a historic masonry building where impact F1 surface waves were used, uh, concrete wall reinforcement mapping with ground penetrating radar, uh, the concrete transfer beam, void and honeycomb, ultrasonic pulse velocity and tomography, load testing of building floor slabs, uh, parking structure assessments that Dennis will be talking about, with impact echo, corrosion damage, et cetera, uh, honeycomb void assessment on a deck, as well as slab on grade thickness mapping and a building slab with honeycomb and void mapping. I think we'll get to most of these. We might end up uh, skipping a bit on some radar. So the methods and structural applications for concrete and masonry in particular, are impact echo, finding concrete cracking, corrosion damage with lamination, honeycomb thickness, voided versus grouted post-tensioning ducts. Surface waves can be used for cracking crack depths, perpendicular crack depths in particular, void honeycomb and the velocity and modulus material. Both of those tests are one-sided access tests. The ultrasonic pulse velocity tomography is used for internal flaws imaging, often void and honeycomb in concrete, can also be used on wood. Uh, so we've done a number of wood structures. The slab impulse response, not gonna to really touch too much on that today, but can be used for integrity and approach slab void Void below slabs on grade, et cetera. Uh, ground penetrating radar for steel mapping and corrosion potential. It's not really damage like impact echo, but it is the potential of corrosion. Infrared tomography, looking at shallow lamination corrosion damage. We're not going to go into that today. Plus a bit on ultrasonic pulse echo for section corrosion loss and cracks uh, in steel members. So the first case history is on the Grace Episcopal Church in Paducah, Kentucky. It was designed by Henry Condon. It's on the National Historic, Historic Register and it's in use today. It was completed in 19, 1873 and NDE was used uh, as part of a bell tower assessment for a retrofit because it's located in an area of earthquake risk. So there was clues of distress. You could see organics, mold and moss above the porch roof flashing, uh, micro spalling over the doorway, vertical cracks at the doorways. You can see some of the spalling there. Some more pictures of damage, some crack monitors were put on it to check how much it was moving and opening. You can see a visible break point, some spall bands looking up at the bell tower. Uh, the vertical and horizontal thrust diagrams are shown here around the arch doorway and you can see on the left, the cracking damage above it. This is showing again, how much it is bending out and the cracking at the edges of the structure. And there you get a view that it's approaching an inch that it has kicked out at this hinge point. 
This is showing the earthquake risk and Paducah, Kentucky is very close to this area where the mouse is pointing at it. So cracks and spalls, as I've been mentioning, were observed in the masonry, the bell tower, and the inside and outside walls. The purpose of the NDE was to give information on material integrity of the masonry tower walls, assist in determining the causes of the observed deterioration distress features, and it was also used to provide an estimate of the stiffness and modulus data to design an internally reinforced wall retrofit scheme to resist the earthquake force. So spectral analysis surface waves is shown on the left and the impact echo is shown on the right. Uh, surface waves is basically an impact with a small hammer between two transducers, displacement transducers on our SASW bar. And you measure the velocity of the surface wave and it is affected by the cracks, the materials and competency behind it and between the transducers. Impact echoes one-sided access also, it's got a built-in solenoid impactor or you can use a small hammer for thicker walls and you get the echoes from separations of the uh, vertical collar joints in the wife. By the way, I think I mentioned or maybe showed that this was an old enough that it's a lime mortar for this brick masonry. So the impact echo method is shown on the right. Uh, we have a unit in various platforms that you can test with that impacts with a solenoid, good to about 12 to 18 inches in thickness and it picks up the echoes with a displacement transducer. You can use a small hammer to see out to six feet, maybe a little bit more. So the data analysis of it is that the depth is equal to a shape factor times the compression wave velocity, like ultrasonic pulse velocity, divided by twice the frequency of the echo. It's easier to see these echoes, not so easy in the time domain, but much easier in the frequency domain with an FFT to see the echo resonance of the wall thickness. So there can be multiple resonances, there are multiple resonances for beams and columns and other shapes, but when it's a wall-like shape, like slabs, say a tunnel lining, uh, slabs on grade, walls, et cetera, that is a, generally a single thickness resonant echo peak if there's no damage. If there's cracking at a shallower depth, you'll see a higher frequency echo that corresponds to the shallower depth. And if it's near the surface, you get a resonant echo that's a flexural delamination as Dennis will talk a little bit about. So the simplest product we have is plugs into uh, your Windows tablet or notebook with an audio port and it's battery powered and you pull the trigger and it hits the concrete and you get your test result. So this is a very straightforward lower cost gauge because it's using a Windows tablet or notebook. So the basic signal processing in the raw time domain data is shown on the left of time versus voltage. Uh, and then with no filtering and you do the displacement spectrum of the raw data, you see a resonant peak that corresponds to the transducer resonance and a echo peak that's weak right now at about 7,000 Hertz. When it's filtered, you smooth out the signal in the time domain with a high pass filter of 3000 Hertz and you get rid of that low frequency resonance that is just a function of the displacement transducer. If you used an accelerometer, you would not have that resonance, uh, but generally we use displacement transducers and accelerometers for really thick concrete. So you see a resonant peak now clearly at about 7,000 Hertz that corresponds to eight and a half inches where depth equals velocity, the factored impact echo velocity 0.96 is the number for a slab or wall shape times the compression wave velocity divided by twice the echo frequency. That corresponds to the eight and a half inches. So what we found on the project was we would get echo peaks that uh, the thickness equal this factored velocity divided by twice the frequency. Uh, when it was thicker, we would get the normal thickness. And if there was a mortar crack separation in that vertical collar joint, we would get a higher frequency, which is a shallower thickness echo. So we were getting valuation of the uh, continuity and contact conditions of the lime mortar and joints of this uh, two foot thick masonry wall. So we plotted the results up on a grid and you can see a scale on the right and a legend that says sound, multiple cracks, shallow cracks in the first six inches, cracks at six to 12 inches deep, shallow debonding and plotted the observed crack lines. So this sketch shows those results. The second test we did was spectral analysis surface waves. Uh, 
both of these tests are discussed in the ACI 228 document and as well as the ASTM standard for impact echo. But basically this is the equipment shown on the left of the bar where you can go from close spacings with an extension bar from like six centimeters out to 80 centimeters by moving these transducers and further apart sees deeper. You see at least a, a simple sense without serious flaws is you'll see at least twice the spacing of the receivers, sometimes out to three times. So impacting with a small hammer typically to higher frequencies, a smaller impactor, lower frequencies to see deeper with a larger impactor. But in concrete, it often doesn't take too much of a change of that impact source. A small ball peen hammer works for most applications. So what, we, what are we doing? Shorter wavelength sample, shallow, longer wavelength sample, deeper. And velocity, the fundamental physics is velocity is equal to frequency times wavelength. So this corresponds to the strength and condition of the concrete versus depth, because you're measuring the variation of velocity versus depth, technically wavelength into the structure. So that's the schematic shown again. It can be run into our Freedom Data PC. We can also put it into the NDE 360, which is shown on the left. It's more handheld uh, device that has a compact flash for the data or directly into the Freedom Data PC, which does even more tests than the ND360, which does quite a few, like 10 on the NDE360. So you develop this experimental dispersion curve from the phase data, I'll explain that in a second. Uh, again, depending on velocity equals frequency times wavelength for the Rayleigh wave or surface wave. And use forward modeling. In this case, on this project, we don't always need to do that, but we did it on this project to match the theoretical and experimental curves. So you can get a shear wave velocity versus depth profile. And the shear wave velocity is approximately 10% faster than surface wave velocity in concrete and masonry. And from that, you can calculate with assumptions of density and Poisson's ratio, shear modulus and Young's modulus. So this is an example dispersion curve from the project. Uh, it has wavelengths from nominally 0.4 feet, about the first brick, uh, out to 1.8 feet approaching the wall thickness. And you see a start of velocity around so 1700 feet per second, it goes up to the backside, it got faster with increasing wavelength to about 2200 feet per second. So this is experimental dispersion curve. And here's the dispersive plot shown with the theoretical plot that fit it. And that's out of the WinASASW software. So reasonably good match theoretically. And we did that by inputting the layer thicknesses and velocities of the shear wave with the Poisson's ratio and a unit weight for the masonry. Out of this information then from this, these velocities, you can calculate both shear modulus where that's rho times the shear wave velocity squared and Young's modulus is really two times one plus Poisson's ratio times the shear wave velocity squared times rho. And rho is mass density, unit weight over gravity, as you look at this. So from this information is how we adjusted the theoretical model to match the experimental data and get the layering, the thickness, and the velocities, and really the modulus. So we did the testing on visibly damaged and sound masonry to compare the results. Uh, and we had some very visible damage and some very visible sound areas. So that gave us the basis because we couldn't do any destructive testing and it's difficult to core or just test the masonry destructively in any event. Uh, we worked with James Mason, uh, he's an engineer with McFarland Johnson. He took our data and proceeded to analyze it as follows. It, First, he looked at the original data as discrete point-wise modulus data. And the method of analysis that he used was point krigging. And it's a geostatistical gridding method. It's used in a lot of different fields. It handles regularly spaced data. And also you can incorporate anisotropy and underlying trends. And this is a feature that's in the Surfer 8 by Golden Software. So, he created these isomodulus plots that uh, was based on the low strain modulus of the spectral analysis of surface wave data calculated out of the shear wave velocities I mentioned earlier and showed. And then he applied some Italian research that related on old brick structures 
that related modulus to strength of the masonry. So this is a, using a low strain modulus to predict a relative strength at best. So from that, uh, if you had a Young's modulus of 900 KSI, kips per square inch, that corresponded to a masonry strength of 1600 PSI. So the general very approximately estimated strength range was 500 to 1500 PSI. Now, I don't think anyone believed that that was the true strength of the masonry because we had no destructive testing and it's high, but it did give him basically a strength and stiffness module on which to design and account for in his modeling of how an internal retrofit and the stresses from an earthquake would be distributed in that tower and how he was gonna design the retrofit. So this shows a picture where you've got the arch shown and it's showing those uh, strength contours from 300 in this case to 600 PSI. So in this area with the damage, the strengths were definitely lower and more reasonable. And again, this is projecting and just showing those visible conditions in the photographs that you can see with the strength contours. And so the, the impact deck on the surface waves in particular allowed him to get a good handle on the existing stiffness modulus and strength of the masonry so he could model it for his retrofit design. So in summary, the NTT measurements, the impact echo test identified internal flaws that were parallel to the wall surface, like solid laminations, mortar joints, cracks, and voids. The SESW test provided shear wave velocity profiles of the wall. Uh, the shear wave velocity is related to modulus and elasticity of the tested structure, and surface waves also identified cracks and crack depths perpendicular to the testing surface. With the NDT, uh, so utilization of the NDT characterized the existing materials. It was relatively easy to put into the modeling. It gave a snapshot of the basic structural condition and it facilitated development of the time history degradation of the material and structure. So without NDT, the engineering of the project would have been based on assumptions and point-wise material characterization. The Krigging statistical analysis helped to integrate the NDT data into a complete and rational model that moved directly into the structural analysis for the retrofit design and the modeling of the dynamic impacts of the earthquake on the structure. So on certain projects, I, I, the previous testing was all point by point. Uh, we also have an impact echo scanner system uh, that we use frequently. It's a rolling displacement transducer and solenoid impact scanner system, and it covers a testing area and in less time with a test taken every one inch. So if you look at this, there's the handheld unit. Uh, you can also put it on a handle and roll on a flat, smooth floor slab for profiling the thickness. Uh, the underside of this, though, shows the spring-loaded rolling displacement transducer wheel that every one inch the sensor is lined up with the concrete as one of two solenoids. You can select a smaller solenoid for most testing, typically up to 20 inches, or thicker concrete up to maybe 40 inches uh, with a larger, heavier solenoid. And that's on a spring. So as you roll it, the timing such that either this solenoid or this solenoid will strike the concrete. This part's very similar to the handheld gauge, except then it's a point transducer. Uh, and you can select the solenoid is similar to this one in the handheld gauge. So some just example results quickly about how this can be used. Here a concrete wall was being mapped out for delamination damage. It could be front side or back side. It was nominally uh, 180 millimeter thick wall, about seven and a half inches. And as you rolled it up, every inch or 25 millimeters, you got an impact. So this is that actual impact at the cursor location. This is a scan from zero to about one and a half meters up a wall. And at this location, it's predicting a 126 millimeter echo, meaning there is a cracking damage at the backside of this wall. And so this all got plotted up in a 2D color plot, which shows going from the normal expected thickness of around 180 millimeters, but a lot of delamination is present either on the uh, near surface or the far side back of the wall. So it was able to map out very successfully where the damage was present in this one and a half by 30 meter section of the wall. And scans were done here uh, approximately every meter along the length of this wall. It was a one to two meter spacing on this. I think it was one meter in the center area 
and two meters left and right of center. So shifting gears a bit, we're gonna talk about ultrasonic pulse velocity and sonic pulse velocity. Um, this is our ultrasonic transducers. They are waterproof. They're the typical industry uh, frequency of 50 kilohertz. Most transducers are on that order, two inches in diameter. You grease couple them and press them. You can test directly through a wall. You can test indirectly, say on a column or beam from a side to another side or on the surface, but here you only see an inch or two in and we probably use surface waves most of the time instead of pulse velocity. This is a weaker test than doing that. So, and pulse velocity is simply the distance between the, receiver, the source and receiver transducers, which are identical. So you're excited at resonance and respond at resonance. So it's distance divided by the travel time, which is measured in millionths of a second or a microsecond. There's an ASTM standard for this as well, C597. So in general, and this was developed a long time ago as people first started to do ultrasonic testing after World War II of concrete, uh, excellent concrete above 15,000 feet per second, good 12 to 15,000, questionable 10 to 12,000, poor 7 to 10,000, very poor below 7,000 feet per second. So this is a general guideline. It's still a good reference. Obviously it varies with concrete. Softer aggregates is slower. Stronger concrete is faster more cured concrete going say from three days to 28 days. The, it just like strength increases with time of fresh concrete, velocity increases with time. Till after generally most modern concretes within a couple months have, have reached most of their velocity for sure. So this project had to do with a, a large building beam, a transfer beam, where unfortunately there was a uh, delay in the concrete placement that resulted in the concrete setting up before it could be fully vibrated. And they had to start it again. They placed it, but unfortunately they ended up with honeycomb and void in the bottoms of this four and a half foot wide, anomaly three and a half foot tall, plus the slab above it, uh, B on a high rise building. So you can see extensive void and honeycomb present. And the question was, well, how, what was the extent of that void and honeycomb? What did they have to repair? So the ultrasonic pulse last transducers are shown here. They're grease coupled. You can see some of the grease spots right here. Uh, you can use a lithium or grease or even Vaseline, something that's relatively non-staining. Uh, don't use black axle grease, it is very staining. But here you're pushing it on with firm force, coupling on a smoother surface. If it gets too rough, that's a problem. And uh, you would switch to sonic pulse velocity, which is an instrument and hammer and a receiver and it can go further and coupling of the impact energy is very positive. We took the data in this case in the Freedom Data PC. You can also take it with the NDE 360, but that's just our ruggedized field PC for doing the testing made by our sister company, Olson Instruments. Uh, this shows two example results. So it's all explained on the left, uh, but basically this is a good signal. At time zero, you get a little bit of noise as you pulse it but then it arrives at 314 microseconds. You take four and a half feet divided by that time and you get a velocity of 14,331 feet per second, a good velocity. In an area where there was visible honeycomb and going through visible honeycomb, uh, you can't test on void obviously. And you can, so you generally uh, have to be on some concrete of course, but when it hits air, it would block it completely, which is a void. So basically energy would have to go around a void you can see noise. This is the scale above was two and a half volts. This scale is half volt. Oops. And the arrival time is coming in at about 505 microseconds. It's much slower. That's 8,900 feet per second. So just taking a measurement over four and a half feet, you need to think of that as an average velocity because it is. It's just the time required. So with tomography and by doing angled testing where you have crossing ray paths on a grid, then you can determine which of these pixels, if you want to think of that way, in a cross-sectional sense, say this was a beam or a column, that by having crossing ray paths, you mathematically in the algorithms adjust the velocity of the pixels to match the experimental data. That's what the algorithms do in the computer. So you can do a straight ray modeling where you assume every way ray path is straight going between the source and receiver or you can let it curve or be a bending ray, 
Well, that just allows the model to let the energy find the fastest path through the structure. If you generally run straight ray modelings for maybe five iterations, it's fairly fast once you have the data analyzed and prepared, and then a couple of curved rays, and they aren't often so different, but it can be a benefit. And we look at both to see which gives the best representation of the conditions. So what do we get? Uh, those pictures I showed earlier, the first picture was on the left, and I think maybe I'll go back to do that at 17 feet. So at 17 feet, we were testing basically every six inches and also across the bottom where we could and the backside with ultrasonic testing between these various points. And you can see the visible honeycomb and void is fairly severe right there in voiding on this 17 foot location. The 27 foot location, which is the other side of this column, uh, looks better. You can see the points fairly clearly where it was coupled going up the side. Um, and then we tested across the bottom and again on the back side of the beam. So it was directly across, semi-directly angled. So that's what this is showing you. In the upper right are the actual test paths we did. You can see the source, the receiver locations are shown with an R, the source locations are shown with an S, and you can see the various points that we tested to. So with all this data, you can see we're getting very good coverage with a lot of crossing ray paths, direct and angled in the bottom portion of the beam, less so in the upper portion where it was better conditioned. You, you didn't have any access to the top, so we could not get as much. If you've just got a straight across measurement, it's going to be the normal UPV average result. So if you looked at what we got from the straight across measurements at every six inches, uh, going from one inch up to 36 inches, you can see the bottom at one inch is 6,000 feet per second. It's much faster at four inches up, 13,200, but then it gets progressively faster until when you get to the very top, it's the fastest velocity, very good quality concrete. So how does that look in the analyses of the tomogram? Well, you can see where it's good, much of it's good, but the bottom nine inches to the bottom is in void and poor conditions and particularly slow right at the very bottom. And that's reflecting and showing that, okay, you're gonna to have to repair the bottom portion of this but it's good above it. The next one at 27 feet, similar coverage with semi-direct straight across tests of the beam. Uh, this one's more variable. The bottom two measurements at one inch and four inch, even though it looked less severe void and honeycomb, there is more present because you've got slow velocities on just straight across average of 8,300 to 8,900 feet per second. But at seven inches up, it jumps up to being more reasonable 14,000 and higher. The tomogram itself in this velocity scales goes from, from 7,000 to 15,000 plus feet per second. Uh, again, shows that there are bottom areas that were more severe, and you can see this one going up here, undoubtedly affected this 8,900 feet per second velocity more. So the tomogram again shows that yes, it's basically much better, 12,000 feet per second and higher when you get one foot and above. So again, what had to be repaired was in that bottom foot or so and the repairs were done by chipping out, replacing, reforming the concrete. So the tomography has some advantages and disadvantages. It does take some training experience for analysis. The field data collection is straightforward, but it takes time because you're doing many more tests. Uh, it does allow you to image flaws such as void, honeycomb, cracking, poor quality concrete in a 2D and even 3D fashion if you build more tests between each of the cross sections. But normally, we were testing every two feet along this beam and not trying to do angle tests between them. The picture is third, worth a thousand words and the velocity tomograms give you an image of the internal concrete conditions to plan your repairs and for quality assurance repairs if needed. And you do have to have at least two sides to do testing and the area of concern has to be between you where your test points are. So the next thing I'm gonna talk about is ultrasonic thickness. And this is for testing for corrosion flaws in steel. Uh, you've got a transducer coupled with ultrasonic gel shown here on steel. Uh, basically, if you have a corroded section, you will get a shallower, thinner echo. It is not as thick versus a full section echo. So we've done this on a variety of structures, including steel frame buildings. This one was affected by a hurricane and got some corrosion. 
so reaching that transducer in there with the gauge shown here, uh, and you see multiple echoes on the screen of that thickness for loss of steel section, like was shown above. Uh, and you can see corrosion of some portion of that steel member right there. Uh, you can also do this type of testing for anchor bolt integrity and length. There's a nice clear echo showing it's about a six inch long bolt. It should have been 24 inches long. That is a broken bolt echo. That's what the screen is telling us here. And you just couple to the top of it. So the final thing I'm going to touch on and let Dennis get into it is single point proof load testing. Uh, comes up once in a while on buildings, whether they're being retrofitted or even new in this case, that people are concerned that it may not be stiff enough. It may be deflecting too much. So they had possible displacements of up to 13 sixteenths of an inch, which they noticed when they put cabinets, started to install cabinets in this condominium building in the kitchen area. So they were worried about excess movement. So the structural engineer wanted a quick proof load test to make sure that it was not deflecting more than he was comfortable with. Uh, and we did that. If you're doing a full blown load test of a floor area, it can be done for ACI 437, which talks about the load test of concrete structures. Basically, in this case, per the code, you would do 24 hours where you would increase the load by quarter load increments, maintain that load for 24 hours, and then a 24 hour rebound after loading in which it has to recover to, if memory serves me, about 70% or better of where it started from. So that's a more full blown load test. But in this case, it was a straightforward, how stiff is it? load test to just make sure it wasn't too flexible. So this shows the equipment we used. It was a basically a displacement potentiometer type approach connected to the Freedom Data PC a module for that with a dial gauge at the bottom. And there's a blow up here. The instruments were suspended on a rod from the isolated ceiling above. And the displacement potentiometer was the primary measurement instrument, but we had a dial gauge as a backup in case something went wrong with the instrumentation, it shouldn't and it didn't, but it can, we could read the dial gauge. It's always nice to have dial gauges, at least to some extent. So the room was about 12 by 16 feet. Uh, they wanted to see what 340 pounds per foot did along a twin foot line, a lineal line, a line load. That was designed to represent the maximum design live load. And they wanted to see a deflection of less than a quarter inch. The loading was done with hand carry 20 and 80 pound bags to meet that exactly. Uh, 10 minute loading time, 10 minute hold time with no change over that time and a 10 minute unload time. So very quick proof load. So what do we get? Here's the bags of quick creep for the line load and the lighter bags above it to get it at slab at mid span. You can see where the rod is coming down and we're measuring a displacement in between them. So a simple one. Usually you check several points, but this was truly a simple proof load test. Uh, this shows the results as it was being loaded up over that 10 minute period, went up to not very much, two hundredths of an inch, obviously much less than the quarter inch they were worried about. The maximum displacement hit that two hundredths of an inch, then it was unloaded and basically came back almost to where it started at two hundredths, two thousandths of an inch residual displacement. So this passed, no problem. Uh, shifting gears, I will let Dennis Sack take over from here. And thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. This, uh, thank you, Larry, for the uh, introduction and the uh, interesting presentation. I'm going to, uh, as Larry said, switch gears. We're going to be talking about non-destructive evaluation of large slab areas, uh, various types of evaluations. Um, and these are going to be done, since there are large slabs, with our sonic surface scanner. This is, again, doing impact echo testing, similar to what Larry was talking about earlier. But the um, sonic surface scanner shows uh, can be used in large areas and can collect a lot of data very quickly. So the um, as seen here, this is our uh, uh, this is our SSS, our sonic surface scanner in use. Um, it is a larger version of the hand scanner that Larry showed in an earlier slide. It has multiple transducers. It can test, as I noted, large areas of concrete. You can test at a walking speed. And it works on rougher surfaces than the hand scanner. So this will work on broom finished surfaces, uh, tined surfaces, surfaces with uh, some freeze thaw damage or other degradation, as we'll see in uh, one of the examples I'll be showing. So the uh, 
each of the, the sonic surface scanner has two of these wheels, each with six transducers, six uh, uh, impactors, similar to the one, the, the impactor and transducers that are in our uh, in other impact echo devices. They do a test every six inches along each test path. Since you have two wheels, you get a set of tests every six inches alternating between the two wheels. So you're doing two paths at a time with each pass. The transducers themselves are coupled to the concrete through a urethane tire that serves as a dust cover, it's a wear cover, it also helps to improve the coupling. So here's the basic scanner. We use it for impact echo scanning of any kind of concrete. We use it on bridge decks, we use it on um, large slab areas, ramps, parking garages, etc. The same unit can also be configured for spectral analysis of surface waves testing, which we've talked about in a previous webinar uh, for the evaluation of bridge decks specifically. SASW with the uh, S-cubed unit works very well for evaluating uh, concrete bridge decks that are underneath asphalt overlays. So we can use this unit for general concrete quality, you know, evaluate cracking, cracking damage, top and bottom delaminations, as well as for pavement thickness. And I've got some examples of all of these coming up here. As a quick overview of the type of damage you can, you can evaluate, in a sound area, this is basic impact echo. When you impact it, the sound waves travel back and forth between the top and the bottom, as Larry discussed earlier, and you get a thickness that indicates the full thickness. If you have partial cracking, you might get echoes from both the overall thickness and from the thinner crack, from the shallower crack. In an area that's only cracked, you're only going to see the, uh, just, the tight, just the cracking area. What's interesting to note for impact echo is if you have a top delamination, rather than getting a thickness, once it's below about two inches, two and a half inches, you're going to get what we call a flexural response, which is a very low frequency, high amplitude response. It's the hollow sound that you hear when you tap a, a delaminated concrete, when you're doing hammer sounding, when you hit it with a hammer. So in an impact echo result, it looks like this. It's a very high amplitude, very low frequency response. That does not indicate really thick concrete. That indicates that you have flexural, a flexural response from a shallow top delamination. So my first example here is an interesting uh, parking garage ramp. It's a helix ramp, which had a lot of visible damage. We, um, it had visible spalling, delaminations, uh, some freeze thaw damage, other issues. And, um, but they wanted to know what the extent of the hidden damage was, what they couldn't see. And that's always the question. Is there damage down below? Is there additional damage beyond what, what's visible? So scanning was done down this ramp with our S-cube unit in concentric circles, rolling down the ramp in this, you know, following a circular pattern. Yeah, this was our uh, original S-cube unit. It rolls along, same two wheels, just a different frame. And you can see how rough some areas of that sur surface were. This was uh, very heavily degraded by some freeze thaw damage, erosion, other factors. But we were able to still get very usable data. And we were able to then use that data to, to determine slab conditions. So on the left here, we have the time domain and then followed by the spectral response of a sound location. This is only a, it's a nominal five inch thick concrete deck. This is showing her an echo at 4.88 inches, which is pretty, pretty dang close to uh, the five inch thickness that's expected. Here is an echo that's showing a, a response at almost 11 inches. On a five inch deck, that tells us that this has a shallow delamination near the top surface. So this is an area where you have cracking, a horizontal, or cracking that's parallel to the surface just a couple inches down or an inch or so down. So we took all of the results and we mapped them out. This is a single um, 360 degree rotation of the helical uh, ramp, starting at level three and a half, ending at what's called level five, mapped out results. And you can see the red areas have surface delaminations. So quite a extensive surface delaminations on the, uh, what, the north east, northwest side. Down here, these brown, the uh, gray areas are sound. There's no damage. There's a small amount of uh, surface delamination. 
What's interesting to me as well is there are certain areas that have what we call deeper delaminations. So these are delaminations at the bottom rebar mat. These are areas that might fall off and fall down onto the lower level. So these are areas that might be of particular concern. I should note that in these red areas where you have extensive surface delamination, we, can't, we are not able to test down to see deeper if there's also deeper delamination, unless we were to do testing from below looking up, which can, can be done, but that would have to be hand scan. My next example is another uh, parking garage. This is a newly placed parking garage slab. So rather than looking for delamination damage or other issues, in this case, we're looking for concerns about possible honeycomb and void in the slab. They are also worried about overall concrete thickness, but um, primarily they're looking for damage during the, uh, or not damage, but issues from the placement, the original placement. So we scanned this with our, uh, again, our S-Cubed unit. And this is a screenshot from the S-Cubed software showing a typical single scan line. As you can see, it's almost 40, it's over 45 feet long starting here. So we have the nominal thickness of just the slab at around eight inches. Then we have the thickness of the beam of a beam at around seven, 16 to 17 inches, going back to the slab, some variation in thickness, that's pretty normal. And then back to a beam, back to a slab. You can see that there's quite a few test points within this, uh, within this record. There's over a hundred uh, points just in this single scan. Over here, you have the time domain and of course the spectral plot showing a nominal thickness at this cursor location of just under eight inches. So this is a sound location. There's nothing particularly worrisome going on here. What's interesting, I, I think, is that we, you know, the same scan can show the beam and the slab thicknesses quite readily. This is a result showing a similar slab and beam result, but right in the middle of the slab in an area that should be a nominally eight inches, we had several points that were very, very thick. That would indicate in this case, either a shallow surface delamination or a large void or some other uh, honeycomb or some other issue in the, uh, in the result. So we took all of these results from multiple scans and plotted them up. This is a single area of the slab showing beams, these green areas up here at 14 to 16 inches, slabs, the blue areas at around eight inches, seven to eight inches. So this is a sound uh, zone of the overall slab. Here's some additional slab profiles. And here you can see crossing beams, beams going in both directions. And sure enough, one little circled area, this is a small anomaly that has some, some issues. And that corresponds to that one scan that I showed earlier. So this would be where we would tell the client, okay, take some cores here, do some chipping, take a look and see what's going on because that, that anomaly is something out of the ordinary. But overall their slab was in pretty good uh, condition. Now I'd like to talk about a really a completely different use of the uh, impact echo method. And this is for thickness verification and, and uh, mapping, really a, statist a statistical study of how thick a slab is and how much variation there is. This was a large outdoor industrial slab, uh, nominally supposed to be, I think, seven and a half inches thick. It was uh, placed and over the course of several years after placement, they, had, uh, they were noting issues with some localized subsidence, some localized cracking damage, not everywhere in the slab, but just certain areas as they were driving trucks over it. So the suspicion was that maybe this slab was not very even. Maybe there was issues with how thick it was. So we used the S-cubed IE system to do impact echo scanning along a number of lines, enough lines to get a statistically valid sampling of the total slab area. The area in question was about 50,000 square feet. So it's uh, 500 feet long by 100, about 100, 110 feet wide. This is an example of the slab where they had some subsidence. They actually had to do some repairs here. There was cracking and other areas. These areas were pretty severe where they occurred, but they were very localized. So the concern was, well, what's going on with our slab? Here's me actually out there doing some scanning across this slab with the uh, S-Cube unit. Just again, we walk along at a walking speed. And here's a typical profile. This is going north to south along the short uh, axis of the scan area, a single scan. 
And you can see how much variation there is in thickness as we go along this nominally seven and a half inch thick slab on grade. And uh, this is probably not unusual for a slab on grade, but this in this single scan, we have thicknesses from less than six inches to over 10 inches. It's quite a bit of, a bit of variation. So we took all of these scans and we did a statistical uh, analysis on them, 8,700 plus uh, valid points. And we're able to determine the percentage that were below and above certain thresholds that were uh, relevant to this slab to determine what percentage were, be were, were below a certain threshold that would be considered of concern. And so the impact echo method worked quite well. We also, by the way, did some calibration tests with impact echo, single point impact echo, in areas where we knew the slab thickness along the edge or next to some cores. So we had some known slab thickness locations for calibration. And to, to uh, verify that calibration, you know, as a verification that the impact echo method can be used uh, for this particular application, we had done a number of years ago an impact echo testing study with Caltrans on uh, freeway slabs, verifying that to, to look at how accurate the impact echo test method can be for measuring slab thickness. And the short and long of it is that when you calibrate the impact echo method to a known thickness location, you can get data within 0.16 inches of actual values on a slab that's 12 inches thick. That's one to 2%. Give a quick overview of what we did. This is an uh, impact echo test head, again, a single point head. This particular uh, unit had a, what we call the SW arm for surface wave testing, in addition to impact echo testing. This was another test, uh, test unit from a different manufacturer. Caltrans was testing several different impact echo devices to see if there was any uh, difference between them. And these were tested on a uh, slab, uh, a freeway slab, concrete freeway slab to, to measure thickness. So with no calibration at all, you can see the impact echo method was pretty dang accurate comparing the cores to the impact echo method. When we uh, calibrated them, so the mean difference was less than, it was right around half an inch, just over half an inch for the CTG with no calibration at all. And that's at 12 inches. So that's on the order of about 5%. With uh, calibration from a single core and then back calculating the thickness at a number of other cores, we, that's where the 0.16 average uh, accuracy came from. So this shows that using impact echo in the impact echo scanner or the S cubed is indeed quite valid for uh, statistical sampling of, of slab thickness. The uh, last example I'm gonna show is a, another interesting application of the uh, S cube unit using impact echo. This was a newly placed elevated slab on a building where during the placement, they had an issue where the concrete trucks or the concrete delivery was interrupted. So they had a known cold joint and it was not just a, a vertical cold joint, it was actually at an angle because of the way the concrete was placed and flowed across the slab. They knew they had this angled cold joint. What they didn't know was where exactly it was and what the condition was of that cold joint. So we scanned this entire slab area with the S cubed. It went fairly quickly. Again, there's the uh, scanner wheel on the slab, a little bit rough, but it worked just fine. And we were able to then map out the whole slab uh, versus thickness. The green areas, this is a nominally 11, 12 inch slab, the green areas are sound. The white areas like this are areas where they had wood or cutouts. There's quite a few penetrations and cutouts. This area right through here is where the cold joint was that where they had issues. They had voids and honeycomb. It's showing up as either too thick or too thin. And a void and honeycomb can show up either way depending on the nature of the debonding and cracking. So this was the area that they then had to uh, redo. There was a little bit of concern area down here. Turned out this cold joint runs right along down through here. So this area and up in here needed to be addressed, but the rest of it was in pretty good shape. So that's our uh, presentation for today. Olson Engineering and Olson Instruments, as Larry noted, we've been around for quite a few years. Um, if you have questions on non-destructive testing, non-destructive evaluation, 
on any of these areas, foundations, slabs, et cetera, just go ahead and contact us either through email, phone call, et cetera. And at this point, I'm going to uh, open it up for questions. Uh, I think Sterling probably already has some questions on our chat box. And if I can't answer them, I'll call Larry in and he can answer. Okay, so the first question involves Impact Echo. And there are two questions to this. Okay, so it's how do you fix your Impact Echo instrument frequency resonating or responding with structure frequency? The way I'm going to interpret that question is how do we couple the impact echo to the concrete first? Um, for the coupling, we use urethane typically on the scanning units. We have uh, other types of you know, hard plastic or urethane couplers for impact echo. It's all, uh, there's no couplet required or no special couplet material. It's very resilient. The typical urethane tire on a scanner, we've scanned miles and miles of concrete with, without having to replace them. So that lasts quite a while. Um, typical frequency range of impact echo is mostly in the audio frequency range. Uh, typically from you know, 1,000, 2,000 Hertz out to 20 to 30 kilohertz, uh, if that hopefully answers your question. Sterling? A second question, does the steel density affect the UPV measurements? There is a small effect. Uh, different types of steel have a slightly different uh, velocity. Are, are we talking impact? Wait, was that impact deck or UT? Because we, we talked about both. Uh, it was around the time that you were talking about impact echo. Okay, so right. impact Sorry, echo, echo, the density of the reinforcing steel has little to no effect on the impact echo results. The reason for that is that the impact echo wavelengths typically are much longer or wider than the, than the diameter of the steel. And if you think about it, the cross-sectional area of the steel in a concrete structure is still very small compared to the overall area of the concrete. And thus the sound waves from an impact echo test are traveling almost exclu exclusively through the concrete. They're affected. There's a small effect on the steel. And if you happen to be test doing an impact echo test end on it right in parallel with a you know two inch steel bar, yeah, you might see some effect from that, but that is so rare. The, about the only time I've seen any effect from steel is if we happen to be testing across the bottom of a beam that has a whole lot of very large diameter uh, bars in them. And even then it's a relatively small effect. So in general, impact echo is not affected by the rebar, uh, which is generally what we, we you know, it's, it's one of the advantages of the method. Really? Can we find compressive strength by UPV for the indirect method? Indirect, okay. Yeah, it's, so uh, you can- You have to have a correlation. Right. The problem with the problem with trying to get uh, you know there is a, a correlation or there is a relationship between velocity and strength for concrete. Unfortunately, there is not a universal correlation between velocity and strength. You need to um, come up with a correlation curve for each individual mix design, and that's primarily due to changes in the aggregate. When you get different types of aggregate, that sets a different base velocity for a given strength. But if you can set the, uh, what we you might think of as the zero point for your, um, for your concrete, then you can indeed come up with a correlation curve between concrete strength and velocity, which we have done on some on structures. But you really can't just go into a structure, do a UPV test across the uh, concrete and say, okay, that's 6,480 PSI. Um, same applies to the yeah, yeah, it was same with a lot of different tests. One of the things you, you mentioned in the question, it was specifically mentioned the indirect method. Um, indirect is really poor at trying to determine uh, strength because it's really poor at determining actual velocity. Because when you're doing indirect UPV is when you have the transducers on the same face and you're testing between them through the concrete horizontally. When you have the, trans the UPV transducers on this face, most of the energy is going down into the structure. Only a very small amount of P wave energy is going horizontally between the two, the two transducers. And the transducers themselves have diameter. And how do you define where that signal is coming from? The exact spacing gets a little nebulous and in fact can be five, 10% or more variation. And that kind of variation is a very large uh, change, can be a very large uh, change in strength or apparent strength. So I would not recommend doing indirect at all to try to determine strength in, in, uh, with UPV. 
Direct testing top to bottom would be the best way if you are going to try to do that. Next question, sir. Should the wave speed from UPV and CSL measured on the upper portion of the drilled shaft be the similar or the same? That's an interesting one. It, uh, the, the simple question is yes, in theory they should be. The, uh, the more uh, detailed answer is that keep in mind that when you're doing UPV, your transducers are suspended in water-filled tubes. I'm sorry, doing CSL, your, your transducers are suspended in water-filled tubes. So you have a certain amount of water in your path in, inside both tubes. If you have a two inch tube with a inch and a half diameter transducer, you could have up to a half an inch of water on each end. And that water has a significantly lower velocity than the concrete. So what, what we have found is that at really short tube spacings, eight, 10, 12, 14 inches, the CSL velocity is typically lower than the UPV velocity if you were to measure it directly with the transducers. On longer spacings, when you get out to 30, 50 inch spacings, that water becomes pretty much irrelevant in the uh, measurement of the, uh, of the velocity and the, the two velocities become pretty much, should become pretty much the same. Now, this is, as you mentioned, only accurate at the top of the, of the shaft because as you go further down, the tube spacing can vary in a CSL test. You can still identify defects, of course, because defect has a very sudden abrupt change in velocity. But as the tube spacing, the tube spacings might vary as they, as you go down the shaft, depending on how well tied they are to the rebar cage and other issues. So, all right, Sterling. Can we use wave speed estimated from UPV on the upper side of the drilled shaft for pile integrity testing? Um, yeah, certainly. If you are you for uh, if you're trying to then do a, apply it to the velocity part of a PIT test or a, what we call sonic echo impulse response test, yeah, you can certainly do that. It's it's uh, relative. It's valid. Um, yeah, I don't see a problem with that. How about using the S cubed IE for slabs on grade evaluation subjected to fire? Um, I would use, right, as Larry just mentioned, we would use the surface wave mode for that. Surface waves work really well for fire damage. That's a whole other presentation that I could give is evaluation of fire damage concrete. Um, typically, impact echo can be used for fire damage, but all it's going to tell you is whether something is damaged or not. The surface wave method can tell you how deep the damage goes. And we've used that really effectively for uh, damage depth of fire damage concrete. Okay, how did you do the calibration in the case of assessment slab thickness? We had some known thickness locations towards at the edge of the slab and I actually used a single point impact echo device, the CTG2 that Larry showed you earlier or a very, I, Trying to remember if I use that or a data PC, but we use the single point impact echo device to measure the thickness at known thickness locations to set the velocity. I did a, about a dozen tests and they uh, we came up on, on various thicknesses to come up with a nice curve and we're able to fit that and then calibrate, use that as a calibration. Or you can core drill it. Yeah, you can also, as Larry just mentioned, you can also core drill at, known, at a known thickness location. You can core drill after the testing is done and uh, just back calculate what the, the uh, actual velocity is. And, and all of the results can then be recalculated. What we have found and what the Caltrans study showed and what we found over many, many years is that for a given mixed design and a given placement, the actual velocity, unless you have a problem in your concrete, the actual velocity is a very small variation in velocity. Uh, the actual, there will be a very small variation in the velocity of the concrete throughout the entire placement. So measuring the velocity at one or two locations will normally give you a very accurate um, impact echo velocity to use for thickness through the entire uh, slab area or a placement. That's not the case when once you go to a new location, of course. So, Which method do you use to map the data? To map the data? I, I, we use, uh, I mean, the program, we typically, if we're mapping it out graphically, we use Surfer or other graphical programs. Program yeah, our the S cube software has some basic two uh, D, three D, you know, two D plus uh, thickness mapping as well built into it. So there's a number of programs available. You can even do some of the plotting in Excel. Um, those plots that you saw that I presented that were thickness along a scan line, those were done from an Excel plot. So there's a number of programs available. I guess if if I'm understanding your question right. 
Really? Were there any differences between the instruments during the Caltrans test? Uh, the, there wasn't much difference as far as the uh, accuracy. It depended on the starting velocity used, how accurate they were before calibration. Um, if you go back to the, if we, you know, in the slide, the particular slide after calibration, I think our CTG had a mean accuracy of 0.16 and the other unit had a mean accuracy, I think of 0.32. So they're both pretty close. The biggest difference, frankly, was that our unit was a lot easier to use, but that's a, you know, that was a number of years ago. Um, we were able to get data much quicker uh, with our CTG unit. What are the advantages of IE compared to GPR? Well, they're two very different tests. Um, GPR is, is an electromagnetic test where you're measuring the concrete properties, electromagnetic properties. GPR is very sensitive to rebar. Impact echo is not sensitive at all to rebar as we uh, discussed earlier. Uh, impact echo we have found is typically more accurate for thickness. GPR can see the thickness, but it's more difficult to pick out more precisely that bottom echo from the bottom of a slab. And depending on the interface, there may not be much of an interface down at the bottom of GPR, particularly, or if you have a lot of rebar, you may not see the bottom of the slab, whereas impact echo can. Impact echo also will detect cracks in a slab and GPR will blow right through them. Typically GPR is not a good tool for <clears throat> determining concrete integrity. In fact, it's, a, it's really a lousy tool for concrete integrity. It doesn't work well at all. <laughs> We've had a, several projects recently where people have tried GPR and that didn't work and they called us up and we did impact echo and it worked really well for, the, for that type of uh, application, like trying to find honeycomb, void, cracking, other things in, in concrete. GPR just doesn't work well for that. In a future webinar, we'll talk much more about radar. Yeah, Larry just mentioned, we'll, we'll have a whole webinar where we'll talk about GPR and what its advantages and limitations are and what you can do with it, what you shouldn't do with it. Uh, all of these test methods have advantages, limitations. And one of the things, you know, from our 30 some years of experience, we have a really good idea of what you can and cannot do with a given test method. So if you have questions, you know, obviously give us a call or send us an email, we'll, we'll tell you what, what makes sense. Sterling? How about using the S-cubed IE for pre-stressed concrete slabs? Will weather corrosion also be identified? Will what kind of corrosion? Weather corrosion. Oh, well, corrosion will be identified if it results in cracking of the concrete. The S-cube detects cracks. It doesn't detect corrosion per se. So it's looking for the cracking that corrosion damage causes. If you have any kind of significant corrosion on a pre, and, and by the way, there's no particular problem using the S cubed on a pre, uh, precast slab as long as it's thick enough, you know, more than about what three inches, Larry, somewhere in there, three three and a half inches, uh, we can we can use the S cubed or any impact echo device for scanning it. As far as corrosion, again, it's going to detect cracking from the corrosion damage, delamination at the top or bottom, uh, cracking from the inside. Corrosion in and of itself will not be detected if it's minor enough that nothing is cracked yet. Can we detect the corrosion of steel and the affected concrete zone? Well, again, that's pretty much what I just answered in the previous question. You can detect, you cannot detect the directly the corrosion with impact echo type testing. You can and very easily detect the cracking that the corrosion results in. Now there are other test methods, uh, galvanostatic, galvapulse, half cell, GPR. even GPR that can be used for corrosion, for detecting chlorides in concrete, for detecting corrosion products, uh, corrosion damage, et cetera. It's like corrosion potential mapping. Yeah. Resistivity. Resistivity, corrosion potential mapping. Larry's giving some other thoughts here. Again, that's a whole nother webinar. <laughs> Okay, this question relates to the proof load test. Do you mind that the proof test reading did not return to the original value? Is this a sign that the test itself caused damage? If not, what do you attribute the permanent displacement to? Well, since um, I'll let Larry answer that one, but yeah, go ahead, Larry. If my memory serves correctly, the, AS, the ACI load test standard wants it to come back after you have this sustained period of loading of 24 hours and 24 hours maintaining and 24 hours for unloading, that it rebounded within 70% of where it was in the first place. Since it came back to 90% of where it started, it was not of concern. And that's only two thousandths of an inch. 
And it was, that was a much shorter duration test. So, because it was 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. So it might well have come back all the way uh, with a 24 hour period. Pretty much every blood test has some dysteresis. Yeah, there could be a little bit off, but basically that was not of concern. Okay, what is the value of white patches honeycomb in your scale in your last slide? Oh, oh. <laughs> Dennis will talk about that. I can, I can answer that. Okay, so the purple areas in that last slide were actually the honeycomb areas. The white areas were areas where we were on top of say wood or cutouts or holes where there was no data. So white areas in that particular slide were no data where the data was invalid and we just threw that out. So the red areas were shallow cracks the purple areas were deep, were things that were areas that appeared to be deeper than the concrete could possibly be and therefore indicated to be a honeycomb or void. Okay, we have a comment that just says a webinar on fire damage assessment in concrete structures would be really welcome. Okay, we'll keep that in mind. Thank you. Okay, the next question is how do you see the application of artificial intelligence in the future of NDE? Um, the biggest thing would be in the analysis of the data and putting the data together, particularly melding data from different test methods so that you can uh, come up with a better idea of what the overall um, structural performance is. You can, there is also applications that they're being worked on right now in artificial intelligence, just in, in taking noisy data or data that is uh, not as clear and trying to figure out what this data means. Because there's a lot of information that isn't necessarily used in all some of these sound waveforms. Okay, and the last question is, does Olson offer NDT equipment packages? Yes, we do. Olson Instruments sells uh, equipment that does non-destructive testing, and uh, you can contact us, uh, Dave Landis, or email me uh, at the contact information slide. Uh, Olson Instruments is our uh, sister company, our subsidiary that sells instruments of various types for impact echo and ultrasonic pulse velocity and a number of other test methods. You mentioned that a link will be put up together. Yep. So within uh, a week or less, we'll be putting up a link to this webinar and all of this information is there. You can also look at any of, as Larry mentioned at the beginning of our uh, presentation, you can look at, uh, go to our website, look at any of our previous webinars. So with that, I think we're going to end this and thank you very much for attending and we hope uh, you all found this very useful.